All right, good morning. Woo! It's great to see some old faces and absolutely wonderful to see all the new faces in the room. So I'm gonna tell you, the Army is really excited this year to be a sponsor, um, one of the sponsors for South by Southwest and we couldn't think of a better way to kick that off um, by starting with this panel here today. So you might ask, why is the Army um, participating? Well, it's really simple. So the Army, your United States Army, conducts some of the most cutting edge research and innovation in the world. And our role in technology development and national security is crucial to protecting our future. We cannot do that without cultivating the talent through education and experiences. So that's why we wanted to be here with you all today. Speaking of the future, Army Futures Command, the Army's newest uh, major command, it's, just, it's located just a few blocks from here, so right in the heart of Austin, and we're really excited about that. Our purpose is to transform the Army to ensure war-winning future readiness. So how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, we do that by prioritizing our people people part, so we believe investing in our people is investing in the readiness, which is a top priority for the Army. Then we do this by designing and delivering the Army of the future, looking as far out as 2040. So we're going to get to the good part now. In honor of Women's History Month, as I've been uh, conversing back and forth with these three wonderful ladies, they reminded me of a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, and I quote, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. So, what do I mean by that? Well, their dreams were service, doing something, being part of something bigger than themselves. So I think you'll hear that theme throughout our uh, conversation today. So I couldn't be more excited to introduce Ms. Hong Miller. So, Ms. Miller, she is the Chief Human Capital Officer for Army's Futures Command. And uh, one thing, while I was doing some background research on these ladies, one thing that stood out to me in an interview I found when she became a member of the Senior Executive Service was, she stated, I'm drawn to the opportunity to lead and influence people in a positive way. Helping people see and reach their potential is what energizes her. Absolutely amazing. And then we have Brigadier General Stephanie Ahern. <laughs> so she is the Director of Concepts from the Futures and Concept Center, Army Futures Command. And uh, I will tell you, she is the big brain power. She was one of four authors for our 2017 National Security um, Strategy. She has a bachelor's in engineering. She has two master's degree, degrees, one in political science and one in uh, strategic studies. And then she also has a PhD in political science from the University of Notre Dame. And she's a West Point graduate. <laughs> All right. Then we have, last, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Ann Petrock. So she, she is our senior research scientist in Warheads technology. What does that mean? She's gonna tell us all about that. Um, and she's from the Combat Capabilities Development Command Armament Center under Army Futures Command. And so I will tell you that Dr. Petrock, she may be a research scientist by day, but by night she's an entrepreneur. So she was a former partner in a, she previously owned a restaurant. And currently, this, I'm gonna get you, get you. Currently, she's the owner of a Christmas tree farm. So, fun facts. <laughs> All right, to get, kick this off, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So, first question, what drew you to your profession and what do you enjoy most about your career? So, Ms. Miller, we'll start with you. 
So what drew me to my profession? Um, really, that quote that um, Lauren mentioned um, really is what drew me to my career. I was um, an Army brat growing up in San Antonio, Texas, my hometown. Um, I was born abroad, two years old, when um, dad came back from Vietnam and brought us and settled us down in San Antonio, Texas. And um, so, I was going to school at St. Mary's University. I actually was a marketing major there, had never heard of this thing called human resources. But during um, work study, I worked for a human resources professor, grading papers, um, got to see a lot of, got to get a lot of insight about what that was about. And so that was kind of that initial thing that drew me in. And as I um, graduated, and was able to begin my career, there were opportunities in human resources. And so when I think about my career, I really think of it in terms of stepping stones. And so if I were to tell you about my career, I would um, lay it out in terms of bricks. I would tell you that my initial beginnings of my career were really about, um, it, it's aligned to a brick of discovery where I was learning about what, the, what it was to be a federal servant, um, what the military had to offer me. Um, my dad, as I told you, was um, an army soldier who said, hey, give Roxy a try. I tried it, it wasn't for me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so then I had the opportunity to um, go into a civilian position while I was in college and that really set my career off. Um, and so I was a college intern. I had the opportunity to work while I was in school during the summers and, and during um, time between summer semesters. I then, once I graduated, had the opportunity to become um, a fellow where I was able to develop my career, um, GS7, Target 11, if you're familiar with um, the general schedule grades, the traditional general schedule grades. And so that was really a time of discovery. Um, I also would tell you that next brick for me was a brick of knowledge where I was really focused on honing my craft as a human resource practitioner. Um, I got my start in, with the Air Force, but remember, we're all part of the Department of Defense. We're all focused on the defense mission, and so it's a great thing when you work for such a large employer. I think DOD is the largest employer, um, and so it was nice to have my beginnings there, but know that I had some flexibility to move around and do different things, um, not just different kinds of jobs, but the opportunity to work in different locations. If I wanted to, I could go overseas. Um, I could work anywhere in the US where um, there were job opportunities in my career field. My next brick would be a brick of opportunity. And this is where I had the chance to make a difference for civilians across the Department of Defense during base realignment and closure period. Um, you know, during that time, we're usually downsizing, we're realigning our resources, and so what I had the opportunity to do was help to refocus that talent um, and keep them from walking out the door, but we were able to recycle that talent for the continuing DOD mission by placing those people matching their skills to other opportunities. Um, I also had a chance to shape um, employment and compensation policy for the entire Department of Defense. And I got to go and actually champion some of the authorities that we have today, like our direct hire authority that gives us more streamlined hiring capability. I also had the chance to, um, actually my next brick that I want to talk about is the brick of compassion. And that came when I got the chance to go work for the Defense Logistics Agency. That happened at the height, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in 2020. 
And so when you talk about taking care of people, everything I did in that job truly was around taking care of the workforce for that agency. 26,000 people across the globe we were issuing policy based on changing requirements, um, changing guidance daily, um, but we had to make the right decisions um, with the guidance that we were getting and put it out in a way that helped our people um, to be safe and to continue that mission. And then the last brick that I would talk about in my career was is the brick of influence, and that's where I had the opportunity to come to the Army stepping into the senior executive service. Um, and that, that opportunity um, enabled me to be able to influence human resources um, programs in a way that really makes an impact for the people of the Army. Um, my initial appointment into the Army senior um, executive service was directing the Civilian Human Resource Agency. Um, about 4,800 people that I had a responsibility for directing um, operational HR across the globe. And then I had the opportunity to come back to Texas, my home state, and serve with Army Futures in my current role where I have the opportunity to shape human resources programs that, that really shape how um, we develop and manage our talent today and how we prepare for the talent we're gonna need in the future. Thank you, Ms. Miller. General Ahern. Thank you, and ma'am, I would say as one of those folks that's benefiting, thank you for what you're doing. Um, so as far as with what drew me to the profession and what I enjoy most, so I wanted to help make a difference. I come from Southwest Ohio, middle of three girls. My dad's a metallurgist, so another scientist, uh, research engineer. Uh, my mom's a medical tech. I have basically no military in my background. But I was an athlete, maybe not the best, but I was able to hold my own in uh, largely team sports. Uh, good, good grades, and I was in a lot of activities. I really wanted a challenge. I, I wanted to travel, and I love working with people to help solve tough issues. And so being able to, to do all of these things and get paid for it has been awesome. Um, and so I think as far as what do I enjoy most, the bottom line is I enjoy handling t difficult challenges, meaningful work alongside some absolutely amazing folks. Um, and so in what we do every day, I get to work with amazing scientists, people that are working on the threat, people working on the law of armed conflict that are legal experts, analysis, people that are helping from a personnel perspective. There are so many opportunities to serve careers in uniform. Obviously, as this panel, there are so many different ways of serving our country for the Army. Um, and I think I started out as an engineer. I really, really enjoyed that, but I switched over to be a strategist. Uh, and so it's a different way of serving. Um, and, and with that, uh, being able to lead people in combat, to be able to lead people in disasters, to be able to get the army to pay for my education, all of it. Um, and I think you know, being able to sit in meetings in the Pentagon or at the State Department or the Treasury Department or in the White House Situation Room has been really, really amazing. And so there's just, there's so many opportunities to serve on this. Um, what I do right now also, uh, because what do I enjoy most, is part of my day job. So we are responsible with many, many different partners to be ready so that in the future, and we look are looking at 2030 to 2040, to make sure that our soldiers that are part of the Joint Force are ready for whatever is coming at them. Um, and I would say that 2040 may seem forever. Um, if any, does anybody have uh, kids or grandkids or neighbors in kindergarten? You at least know some people? Okay, so when they, when they become college graduates, I would expect that technology will probably have changed by then. I think that's probably a fair assumption, especially being here in Austin. Um, however, we will still have earthquakes, and we will still have floods, and we will still have others from other parts of, of our world who wish us and our allies harm. And so what our job is within the, the part of Army Futures Command that I work on is to work with the scientists, to work with people who are looking at the threat, to work with, with lawyers who understand the law of armed conflict that is not gonna change by 2040, 
and to help make sure that those kids, when they get to be college graduates, are still having that secure and prosperous country. So it's amazing. So anyway, thank you for asking. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Petra. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, um, it, what drew me to the, the field? Uh, I would say um, just following what I love. Um, I have been a nerd my whole life and uh, unabashed. Uh, but, but uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I didn't want to play with Barbies, I wanted to play with robots. So, um, much to my parents' chagrin, I took things apart and I wanted to see how they worked. Couldn't always put them back together. But um, what I found is I, uh, I, I really enjoy that type of thinking and that type of problem solving. And so when the general says, and general, you can always come back to engineering. We need strategic thinking in engineering too. <laughs> so so, uh, so um, the engineering piece of it, solving the hard problems, what you talk to is, is true for me as well. So I wanted to be part of something bigger um, but also be able to solve the hard problems, right? So how do you solve the hard problems and contribute to a greater good? Um, so, so let's go back to 1999, uh, because that's when I was getting my bachelor's in electrical engineering. I am born and raised in New Jersey, and uh, no cheers. Um, <laughs> so, so at that time, I wanted out of New Jersey. I did, I, I had enough, I had gone to college in New Jersey, it was time to go see some other stuff. And at that time, I got a call from the Army. And the Army said, hey, you wanna come be an engineer here with us? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not ready for that, I don't wanna use my talents in, in that kind of way. Um, and of course, at that time, I really didn't know what the Army did, I, I, you know, I, I just, I didn't know. So I said, nope, and I moved my happy self down to North Carolina. And I was a controls engineer um, for a Fortune 500 company where I stayed, uh, I, I made it about 18 months before I realized I'm a Jersey girl and I'm going back. Uh, and so, so, uh, so I went back to New Jersey and I started my own business. And uh, I realized quickly that in order to be taken seriously in instrumentation, so my background is in instrumentation and signal processing. Uh, in order to be taken seriously, I needed an advanced degree, so I went back to college. Um, so I was in grad school when 9-11 happened. And from the top floor of our parking deck, where once stood two beautiful towers, were now these billowing columns of black smoke. And that really had an inf impact on me. And it was, everyone's got a little pivot point in their life, right? And so, but life goes on, and uh, I, I finished my degree, and I went, um, <laughs> my degree is in biomedical engineering, so master's and PhD in biomedical engineering, and, uh, and I ended up doing a postdoc in neurology. So I go, and I'm studying the brain, I'm studying trauma, I'm studying all kinds of things, Parkinson's and autism and sleep disorders. I mean, it was phenomenal. I loved the research that I was doing. But I wasn't really, in, in, from where I sat, wasn't really contributing to a larger purpose. Just as I was kind of struggling with that, the Army called again. <laughs> and they said, hey, what do you think about sharing your talents with us? And this time, I said, well, I am not as brave as those men and women who go out and put that uniform on every day, but I can help them come home safer. I am, <laughs> there's a whole lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's a whole lot that I can contribute to protect our country from those folks that wish us harm. And so I thought, hey, this is a great place for me, let me go check it out. Now, the other part of it with being able to study high-speed shock phenomena, um, my instrumentation and signal processing piece really, really kicked in there, right? Because I thought, I'm gonna nerd out, I'm gonna study the chemistry, I'm gonna study the physics, this is gonna be great. And, uh, and I did, I did and I studied initiation and how you set explosives off. It was, it was fantastic. And it turns out that I was pretty good at breaking stuff. <laughs> my parents knew this. I, I hadn't embraced it yet, but I, my parents knew. So, uh, so I ended up through a series of very fortunate um, occurrences. I, I mean, look, uh, there's always a portion of it that I attribute to luck. Um, and then a lot of it comes from great mentoring 
I was very fortunate to have some outstanding mentors in my career. I actually, so shortly after I started, I was writing up a patent, and uh, at the time, Picatinny had a thing called innovation coaches. And these folks, they came and they, they, uh, they worked with you to try and get your ideas kind of into systems and kind of advance the innovative thought process. And so this, this woman, this coach comes to me, and I, <laughs> I love this woman. So she became a very important mentor in my life. But she comes to me and she looks at me, she talks to me for a couple minutes and she says, you need a mentor. <laughs> and I said, uh, what? No, I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And she said, no, no, you don't even know what you don't know. You need a mentor. And I will tell you that she was spot on because over the course of your career, you're gonna get faced with challenges and kind of things that, that you're just not seeing all the angles and you need someone else's eyes to look at it. And you need to look at it through different eyes of your own. Um, and so mentors were, were a really big part of, of where I am. And, and now, I get to pay it back, right? So, so now, after a series of supervisory and leadership roles, I am now the Army's senior scientist for Warhead Technologies. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is a fantastic job, and I am honored to be able to do it. And I will tell you that I get to travel the globe, and I get to travel the country, and work with academia, and industry, and governments, and whether it's our government or other government labs, uh, uh, allies, partners, um, I get to bring back all of that technology for us to use for the Army. And I don't need to just focus on explosives, or I actually get to look across the whole spectrum. So I look at the electronics industry, I look at pharma, I look at uh, the automotive industry, I look at manufacturing, whatever it takes for us to get the job done and whatever new technologies are coming out that could be brought in to be able to support the general and all of the other missions that we do. So, that's, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next question. The number of women in, in the STEM workforce is on the rise, and I know um, as we were preparing for this panel, I read a lot of different um, research papers on this, and one in particular from the National Science Foundation said in the past 10 years, there's been a rise about, I think, approximately like 31%, so big, big increase. So my question to the panelists are, why is this growth important? What role do you believe you and your STEM colleagues play in continuing that trend? And what role can our audience members here today as educators play in supporting this growth? So Dr. Petrock, I wanna start with you because I know we have some, some recent events yes, that we yes. could talk about. <laughs> yes. So what can we do? I think that the scientists and engineers, the STEM workforce that exists within the Department of Defense has some of the coolest jobs on the planet. And if we're not talking about it, and we're not telling our young people what engineering is, and, or, or science, or mathematics, well, we're doing everyone a disservice, because I need those folks to come up and take my place when I go, right? So I think that it's critical um, for us to actually put a face with STEM. Because STEM, look, when I was a kid, I was coming up, and no one in my family was an engineer. No one even knew what to do with me because I liked math, okay? And so for, <laughs> for me, hearing engineer, well, hey, that's great. It's got great earning potential. Uh, but, but it wasn't, I didn't know what it meant, right? And so you have STEM, what does that mean? It's this kind of thing, this idea, but it, it, what is it? So I think it's our job to make it personal. And so the event that you're talking about was um, up at Picatinny, they host a thing called Introduce a Girl to Engineering Night. And one of the speakers they had up there, oh yeah, I, so, so I've been, <laughs> this is personal to me, I really like going out and having, and supporting these events. I, I love doing things with Girl Scouts, all of that stuff, right? So, so outreach is really critical, but I think that what was moving to me about this specific um, Introduce a Girl to Engineering Night was, I was part of the first one about 10 years ago, and one of the speakers that was there last week, last week, recently, um, she, uh, she actually was at the first one. Now this young lady at the time, she was dragged there by her parents <laughs> and she did not want to be there and she admitted to it and she, she spoke about it because she came back 10 years later as an engineer. Um, she didn't see the relevance, she didn't understand what engineering was, but she got to go there and talk to real engineers about what real engineering was. 
And I think if we're going to have a chance of exciting young people about doing that, we're going to have to get more personal with it. We can't just say, I have STEM events and I have STEM outreach and, and I can check a box and say, I did a STEM outreach effort. It's, it's not going to cut it. And, and I love that the numbers are increasing, but in my opinion, a, a 30% increase even, which sounds fantastic, on only 20% of the population, I don't think it's fast enough. I think, you know, when I, when I graduated, it was two women in my class of 70 for electrical engineers, and you probably saw similar things. Um, so, so anyway, I, I think that making it personal, it, it will go a long way, and I think that all of the educators in here, if, if you have the chance to bring out your folks, your, your people to events, to be able to get them engaged to understand what it is, I think that would go a long way. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Ms. Miller. I just want to weigh in here from um, the human capital perspective. Um, within Army Futures Command, um, not the greatest news, but our workforce, we have a workforce, um, military and civilian, about a little over 19,000, um, 90 percent civilian, and 64 percent of our workforce is STEM. But when we look at the women in that STEM population, we're only at 21%. And something, when you drill down even further, what we see is the greater percentage of women are in medical occupations. And so um, I think all of that tells us that there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, we need to increase our outreach efforts. I know within DEVCOM, DEVCOM, um, the Development Capabilities Command, has a fabulous outreach program where they do, they have the, we call it the AEOP, Army Educational Opportunities Programs, and they do a lot of outreach early um, with youngsters, they have summer camps, they have um, employment summer intern program opportunities and then even fellowship opportunities. And so I think we need to step up our game in those respects and help young women see themselves in places that traditionally they haven't really been encouraged to be in. Um, because it, we know we are so much stronger when we bring varying perspectives to the table and when our, we, when we actually reflect the nation that we serve, we're gonna have much more success. Um, and so we have, we have, like I said, opportunity, we have some work to do, but we've gotta get out there and do a great amount of outreach. We've gotta tell our story, just like Dr. Petrock said. Um, we all have a story and we have opportunities to tell it. And so we need to take that, embrace that, those opportunities and, um, and help make young women aware of what they can be um, if, they, if they just see themselves in it. Thank you. General Ahern, did you have any uh, comments on this one? The only thing I wanna say is, so my daughter is, she's a freshman at Virginia Tech neuroscience. So about 10 to 15 years ago, um, there was a lot of public girls only go STEM, and she believed it. I was like, that's awesome. Um, and periodically, she'll say, you know, she really likes art. I was like, well, everybody needs a hobby. And she really likes creative writing. I'm like, every profession needs to be able to write well. And so I think part of this is just helping people understand what are the options that are there. Um, and that if they do have an interest and they have a strength and you know, can go do robotics clubs, I think this is something that will help make our country more capable and help others where it's needed. So I, just, I think this is, this is all of us, but I do think it's encouraging people from the very beginning, follow your passion. Um, it does not follow a path that maybe people came before. Thank you. And then to add on to Ms. Miller's point about the Army Educational Outreach Program, AEOP, for the educators in the audience. So there's a, a lot of programs, they're K through 12, and then there's also um, programs extending in whether you have an undergrad or a graduate. So go ahead, Google that, AEOP, it'll pull it up and you could take a look at that. All right, getting into our second question. So we know our people are our most valuable asset. And we know the Army is in a race for talent, just like uh, industry and academia, to identify and hire the most skilled professionals. How are you tackling that in your organization to ensure we have the right people 
in the right places at the right time. Um, and then also, can you share with the audience the variety of careers available, whether someone chooses to serve in uniform or as an Army civilian? So Ms. Miller, we'll start with you on sure. this one. Yep, that's all over my space, so <laughs> happy to address that. We have to be deliberate. We are always going to be in a war for talent. Um, and, you know, when you are a federal entity, there's certain limitations or restrictions that, or boundaries that we have to be able to operate within. And so we have to be creative, we have to be deliberate, um, and we have to be visible um, when we're talking about trying to get the best available talent. Within Army Futures Command, um, our commanding general, actually when I came into my position, asked me to build a plan for the workforce of the future. And um, when we took him up on that, we looked at this, because we are Futures Command, as not just, you know, what are the issues that we're dealing with today, but what are those things we're gonna need for the future? And so as we started putting together this human capital operating plan that is really gonna be our guide um, to, to having this workforce of the future for the Army, um, we came up with some specific tenets um, of talent management. And so that first tenet is really about how we acquire people. How do we attract and recruit people to come to work for Army Features Command or even the Army for that matter? And so people recognize what the Army is as far as uniform service not so much as far as civilian service. And so we're working on building a better brand when we talk about civilian service and what that has to offer. Um, we, the second tenet is about employment. How do we optimize the talent that we're able to acquire? How do we make the most of those skills um, and, and ensure that we understand what they're bringing to the table and how can we actually use their, their strengths, their capabilities, their interests. Um, and so that's something that we're working on um, so that we can, can truly be the best that we can be with what we have in our talent pool. The third tenant is about development. How do we prepare our current talent for future requirements. Um, sometimes it's about reskilling. One, we have to understand where our, what our baseline is, what are the gaps that we have, um, and then what are the emerging requirements that may require us to do some reskilling, some development, some training. But not only that, it's not just about what our needs are as a, an organization, as a command, but also how do we help develop people for future opportunities so that they can step up to the plate and be ready when those opportunities present themselves. Um, we have competitive programs. Um, we have our senior enterprise talent management programs that people compete for. Um, and it, they compete with others across the Army. It's not just Army Futures Command. but. We want our people to be competitive so that when they throw their name in the hat, submit their packages, they're gonna come out at the top of, of um, the group um, and be selected for those programs. And so we're working to really strengthen the capability and prepare our, cell, our folks so that they can compete successfully for those opportunities. Um, and then a fourth tenet is enablers, or, I'm sorry, retention. We have to be focused on retaining the people that we acquire. Um, because if we just focus on acquisition and we don't necessarily understand how we retain folks, then we're going to be constantly in a loop trying to get people to come to us. And so um, when we talk about retention, it's really about building the right climate, the right culture that gets, not only attracts people, but makes people want to stay. And I'll tell you, we truly do aspire to compete with NASA, to be one of the best places to work. We are going to be on that list, okay? <laughs> one of the top places to work. Um, and so that's, um, 
that's the fourth tenet. And that last tenet is really about enabling people. This is about making sure that people have the basic resources that they need to be able to perform the work they're assigned to do. And so that's kind of the, the, um, the blueprint of what we're building as we're building out our human capital operating plan. Um, it was mentioned, AFC is a young command. We're almost six years old now. And um, I just have been with AFC for probably a year and two, three months. And so we are, we are excited about the opportunity that's before us and um, being able to launch our human capital operating plan so that we have a real clear road ahead um, on how we're gonna manage and develop our talent to be the greatest workforce across the Army, across the world. Thank you. General Ahern. Thanks. Um, so I think, so I'm gonna answer in two ways. One, as far as Ms. Miller brought this up, within Army Futures Command, we have a good mix of military and civilians. So within my directorate, we're about half and half. Um, and so obviously the military coming from a very, very wide background as we're trying to think about the future. So we try to make sure that people that do artillery and, and infantry, but also the intelligence and people that are looking at the, the technical skills. And then we have the civilian teammates and those are some people that were retired military coming from the different services, but through someone that we got significant help with, Ms. Miller, of a presidential management fellow, never served a day of life uh, in the military. And so being able to have that really diverse expertise and thoughts in what we do. Um, and then I would say from those from being in the uniform, um, one thing that's really important is, is that there are some folks like Major General Brown, myself, who have made a career of this. That's actually not normal. And it's more normal to come in for a couple of years to get skills, to get education, to be able to travel, to be able to have these amazing opportunities and then to go back to your community or to go back to a different community. And so I think if there are something that, you know, you're wanting a change of pace or you're wanting to learn any skill really that you might think you want, so whether it's a high tech, whether it's, uh, so Jeff Sherman in here at Logistics, you've got folks from Chaplin, you've got folks that actually are master chefs, um, all the way through media, we need those that are serving our army as well, serving the military. So there's just, there's so many different opportunities. Come in and then go back out, help America with those skills and education that, that you just got. Thanks. Thank you. Did you have anything you want to add? So, so I would say that um, I gave a lot of kind of excitement about doing STEM outreach stuff, but I think at some point we have to put our money where our mouth is, right? And so, the, uh, one of the programs that I actively engage in is, um, it's the um, MSRDC effort, and it's through DEVCOM, um, and it's to engage minority-serving research and development centers um, with the Department of the Army. And so I actively engage students, because again, I really feel strongly, if I am not someone who can excite someone about engineering, I don't belong in this job. So. So getting out there and, and having those young folks be a part of the work that we do and getting them exposure early to see what's going on. So for me personally, because I work with explosives, it takes a special kind of person to work with explosives. <laughs> so, so, so I work primarily with the, the schools of minds, right? And so kids that are more predisposed to wanting to work in that kind of environment, hazardous environments, um, but it doesn't mean, I mean, look, I had my degree in neurology or uh, biomedical engineering, right? So it doesn't mean that it, it excludes anybody by any stretch of the imagination, but what it means is I have to be dedicated to going out there and doing the footwork, and so, or leg work. Um, I, uh, so, so bringing those folks in and letting them see what kind of capabilities exist and what kind of talent exists, um, kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit, letting them see what's going on. Um, and then also making sure that our people are going out and working with them and with the faculty. Um, because the faculty, you know, we can't overlook how important they are because they're the ones who are telling their students, hey, this is what I want you to go do. So, so I think that there's, there's two pieces of this. And, and yeah, I think that they don't have schools that, that train us to do what we do, but going and, and when I was in supervisory role, I uh, actively recruited former service people because they solve problems so differently 
than engineers, right? So, so well, yeah. you are an engineer, right? But um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so going and and looking for people with different perspectives on the world is so critical, and it doesn't mean whether it's military or civilian. It's just looking at the angle, looking at things through different lenses. Can I have seconds? <laughs> A couple of things I want to add um, that that I should have mentioned when I talk about the Workforce of the Future. So within Army Features Command, we are doing things that are really forward-leaning and things that we haven't done before in the Army. And so, for instance, you might have heard we have um, a um, Army software factory. It's actually located here in Austin where we're teaching soldiers and civilians um, how to code software. Um, to support um, commander decisions. We also have um, in Pittsburgh a um, artificial intelligence integration center where we've got folks learning the art of AI, um, machine learning. And some of that talent that we're developing today, because it's new, new capabilities that we're developing. Today, we don't have clearly laid career paths for some of the, this talent. And so that's some of the stuff that we're working on as well when we talk about that workforce of the future. Another thing that um, we recently got was approval um, to implement a new um, personnel system. And so when I talk about a personnel system, um, I mentioned earlier the general schedule system. That's the traditional system that most folks are familiar with. This new personnel system that we're about to embark on um, at the headquarters and, and several of our um, AFC elements, it really takes us out of traditional Title V personnel um, system and gets us into a more performance-based system where we're actually able to use flexibilities that allow us to pay people for the contributions that they make for the work that they do. It's a pay banded system. It's got some great flexibilities that are inherent with the, um, the, the law that's, that enables, that allows us to implement the system. And so all of that, those are key pieces of what we are, have been working on and what we're launching um, that really supports that, that direction that we're going in for our workforce of the future. Thank you. All right. Next question. Uh, General Ahern, we'll start with you on this one. Why is innovation important for leadership? What a great question. <laughs> um, so I'm going to answer that from a military perspective. Uh, obviously, that's not just a, a uniquely Army question. Um, and I think maybe as a shorthand, at, at the end of the day from leadership, you're trying to inspire others to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. Um, and so I think one of the, the challenges, one of the amazing parts about being in the Army and being a part of the, the US Joint Force is, is that while we are continuing to try to make ourselves better, uh, we really are fairly good at what we do. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's important. Um, we get a lot of time to train, a lot of time to practice, but, but you know, being able to have some of the best technology, working with the best people. But I'd say, irrespective of what profession or career is, is that if you are really good at what you do, um, you can't rest on your laurels. Um, and I would say that you know, one of the things that we feel very deeply is there are real consequences for coming in second in warfare. And so I think as we're trying to be prepared for the future to make sure that our future soldiers and those that they're working never fight a fair fight, uh, the nice part is, is that it's not just an army challenge. It's not just you know, the, the US Department of Defense. These are things that we appreciate our freedom. And there's a lot of others that have very similar approaches. And so I think whether it's the leader or whether you're doing peer leadership, I think being able to pull in different voices and different perspectives to bring in different experts, to be able to have those, how are we solving the different problems in the future? Because I think whether you're putting together tech in a different way or whether you're bringing together teammates for a different way, I actually think it's 
it's often that innovation and how the parts fit together that's most important. And I do think having that perspective from a leader can help make sure that you're not just trying to get a single solution. And just because it worked right last time, it may not work the same as the environment and others are changing with you. Absolutely. Diversity of thought is really important. <laughs> Ms. Miller? So, um, as a senior executive, um, or anyone who's ever um, applied for a senior executive position, you might be familiar with what they call the executive core qualifications. Um, and so there's five areas there that you've got to demonstrate the ability to lead. One of those is change. Um, change, being results driven, having some business acumen, being able to lead people, and being able to build coalitions. All of those are the things that um, we have to constantly, and, and it's not just getting into the executive service, but we're graded on that. Our um, annual reviews, our annual assessments are focused in those areas. And so when we talk about innovation, it is so important as a leader because we're measured against the ability to keep leading in the direction that has that continuous improvement um, focused around it. Um, if one of my best mentors told me a long time ago, if you get comfortable, it's time to move on. And so when we get, when we allow ourselves to get comfortable, um, we get to a place where we become stagnant and we could even become irrelevant. And so it's important from a personal perspective to have an innovative mindset, but from a lead leadership perspective, we have to be innovative. It's so important. It's key to our ability to lead. And, and I would just say that kind of looking at that question a little bit differently, um, leadership is the thing that supports the innovation, right? So the leaders are the ones who free everybody up to go and think in these wildly different ways, um, but they give them that structure and that kind of